Golf Smarter, number 686. Teaching golf to women is different and how it impacts the men in their life with Jamie Zimron. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jamie. Thank you. I'm so happy every time to talk with you, Fred. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, of course, because I do, because we have so much time talking off mic <laughs> than we do. <laughs> it's the productive part that we get to do in the interview itself. And we're going to have to play golf together soon because we need, I think you and I need about four hours to catch up with one another. We need a lot of chatting time for sure. We definitely do. I got to tell you about my Africa trip. Anyway. So um, let, let, let's start with this because it's just so top of mind for everybody, and that is the 2019 Masters and Tiger's victory. Um, do you struggle with separating the golfer from the person? I admit to to some extent I do. When you know Tiger's infidelities and the scandals, and all these things came through, came out uh, into the public. That was very, very difficult for me as a golfer, as an instructor, as an athlete who really, like everyone else, was just quite in awe at his epic abilities, athletic abilities. And I truly believe he's epic in in what he's done. Um, And I also think that his fall from grace was epic, really kind of on the Shakespearean tragedy level. We have really... been living through and witnessing that level of of legend and epicness. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. As a woman, it's very, very difficult for me to uh, handle, to to stomach (laughs) really what he was doing and and the pain and hurt that he caused to his wife and to so many. And um, and that was even before, as we say now, the Me Too era. Um, So, yeah, you know, my sensibilities are, are... uh, you have a hard time, have had a hard time um, with really being the same kind of fan of Tigers. That being said, I really have been working to separate that out um, in the sense that I really recognize his downfall and his difficulties. I'm a psychotherapist as well as a, a golf pro and et cetera. And um, I also, and, I actually, sorry you know, for interrupting, but I also put you, I think of you as a, a feminist activist. Well, I'm, I am. I'm all of those things. Yeah. And a very strong feminist activist. And I'm, uh, I work a lot with women's empowerment, with self-defense, with, uh, you know, protection from sure. from sexual abuses and, and all that. So, um, you know, it's really important to me. Uh, again, as a psychotherapist, I can really kind of look into his upbringing and uh, you know, as an only child. And there were a lot of great things and how his parents trained a tiger. On the other hand, there was a lot of, uh, you might, we might call it emotional abuse. He endured a lot. Um, and then, of course, his huge, huge rise to worldwide fame and stardom and the pressures on him. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I can, I can look compassionately from that point of view. And when I also look at what he's done to recover and in the glare of the public eye. And it was really only a couple of years ago that he endured such humiliation um, <clears throat> with the mug shots that they put out mm. of his, his drunk driving. And it's all of these things. So, and of course his injuries, I actually was in San Diego and walked most of those 90 holes of his U S open victory at Torrey Pines and how he ever even endured the pain of his knee at that point and ended up the winner and walked all those holes. That was pretty mind blowing. Mm. Uh, going through his back surgeries. I mean, I think that we all, every single person goes through tremendous trials and tribulations and difficulties. And at this point, I look at his master's win as really something that we can all look at in terms of how we can recover, how we can redeem ourselves from things that we may not feel good about in our past, how we can bring ourselves to a higher level of development, and that he's done that all in extreme measure and in the public eye. I, I mean, I have to respect that. And it is thrilling to see his, uh, anybody's, and he's the one who's, who's showing it, is that level of mastery of athletic and mind 
mind body expertise prowess is really quite unbelievable so you know <laughs> i'm still a little conflicted i must admit sure. and at the same time happy to see and it is good for the game of golf and honestly like everybody else i mean i was kind of crying and especially to see him hug his kids and for the first time to be able to have his kids there um and, and experience his victory well you know a, a somewhat of a mixed bag unfortunately and yet i i certainly can uh, applaud him. Were you rooting for him that weekend? That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like we're, on Sunday, you know, we're in the yeah. back nine here. Are you cheering him on? Like, oh, I, come on. It's like so many people were, including myself. Well, certainly part of me definitely was. Uh, mm-hmm. I was. I was kind of happy to take uh, varying guys who were in the mix there. I'll tell you the truth uh, on a feminist activist note, and I don't want to say something negative about someone, but you know Brooks, uh, Brooks Kepka, who, again, is a tremendous athlete and a tremendous golfer, I was honestly, I, I'm not a big fan of his, mostly because I consider him kind of, uh, of an embodiment of white male privilege without a lot of sensitivity and sensibilities that that. I feel good about. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I probably shouldn't say that in public, but it is, mm-hmm. it's kind of true. Um, so from that point of view, I was certainly happy to see someone other than him uh, win. It, it, it is so hard to separate the athlete from the person, and we've had so many instances over the last few decades from baseball and football, basketball, and, and, and golf, of course, Um of situations like this. I'll just never forget the line that Charles Barkley, the former NBA player, now announcer, once had about, you know, look at folks, don't hold me up as a role model. Use me as a goal model, but not a role model. Because I'm not perfect. I thought that was just a powerful thing to say is, you know, separate the two. If you want to be a great athlete, then you can look at my you know, look at what I've done and how hard I've worked and what I've done, but you don't have to look at all of what I do because you're going to be disappointed as everybody is about everybody in some way or not. Well, that's true. And we're all human, but honestly, yeah. I don't think you can separate the goal and the role model. Mm. And I think that in our society, you know, athletic champions have to assume responsibility because they are looked up to but particularly by young people and by kids, by ch- children. And so I think that their ethics are really important. I think that, you know, it's going too far to say their politics, but what I mean is just their sense of, of social responsibility, of social justice, of promoting fairness and diversity, equal opportunity. And that can be uh, on the basis of gender. That can be on the basis of race uh, and sexual orientation. I mean, to this day, the discrimination against LGBT people, LGBTQ people in sports is, is huge. Mm-hmm. In, in almost the year 2020, it is still dangerous to come out and say you're gay as an athlete. So I think that it's really important that people who do achieve tremendous success uh, take on some responsibility for the role models that they are, uh, whether they like it or not, especially young people are looking up to them and and what they do affects how how kids and adults think and act um, for themselves so i you know in that regard i think that it is sort of an abdication of what comes with their stardom to say hey you know don't and we can't expect them to be perfect but i do think that those champions who do assume responsibility um, are uh, they they go even further up <laughs> in my book? Yeah, like I, I, you know, I have to say, LeBron James has always been I don't want to say squeaky clean, but he seems to have his motivation in the right place, and he was groomed to be a champion, um, and he seems to be on the up and up with all this stuff. But for for like you and I are on the back nine of life. Okay. We're, and we have, we have, (laughs) we have a perspective of looking back and, and to see somebody in their twenties, 
which most professional athletes are basically in their 20s or early 30s, they're youngsters from us to us. You know, I mean, like they just like they're kids. And to put that kind of pressure on them once we've because all we've done is give them this adulation about, oh, you're a great athlete. You're going to be a star. And, you, you know, you get to have all the perks in the world because you're an athlete. And then all of a sudden to have social responsibility, that's a lot of pressure on a young person who doesn't even get it, I think. Well, I would agree with you. And from our vantage point, you know, we can look back and say, God, you know, you're a kid in your 20s uh, yeah. or even 30s. Um, at the same time, that is part of our generation's responsibility as coaches. And I think that coaches really could use to kind of upgrade their own consciousness and their own sense of responsibility uh, in terms uh, in terms of their coaching to their young athletes. And there are plenty of coaches who do that. And then there are plenty of coaches who are limited by their own, shall we say, you know, prejudices or human frailties. <laughs> so, again, we're not looking for perfection in anybody because that's just not that's not human nature. At the same time, I think that we, especially as we look into society and see the sort of corrosion of values and um, how money and power and fame and fortune tend to predominate so much over over values, over ethics, over inclusion and inclusivity, over a sense of um, what it is to be not only a champion on the field, but off the field. I think that we really need to sort of buff up our efforts in, in those areas. Interesting. Have you ever coached a young person um, and recognized that they had tremendous potential to succeed in their sport and then pulled them aside and said, all right, now let's start teaching you some things about your responsibilities if you become this athlete. Have you ever had that opportunity? I've had a few of those opportunities for sure. And in our sport, since we're on our golf podcast, one of the beautiful things about golf is that we know that it's a uh, gentlemanly, gentlewomanly sport and <laughs> that it's about taking responsibility uh, yourself to uh, you know, call a penalty on yourself, follow the rules, uh, have proper etiquette, be respectful. And <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, golf, it's, we almost have almost more direct opportunity than in some other sports. And I think that's a tremendous thing. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, and so let's, let's talk about coaching women and young women. Um, on now let, let's stay away from the, the martial arts part. Let's stay on golf for this. Because I know mm -hmm. that you've done both, <laughs> successfully <laughs> have done both. Um, let's talk about what it is to, to coach young women, and then let's just move up, and, and we'll spend the rest of this, this podcast talking about um, what it is to coach women, why is it different, what goes on there, um, and what your responsibility is as their teacher um, th in golf and you know, again, if you have a successful one, uh, the responsibility as as being for for their life responsibilities. Well, I would like people to know about the LPGA's initiatives. In uh, we have a program called LPGA USGA Girls Golf Programs, and um, the reason the USGA is in there is that the USGA for years has matched funding dollars. Uh, for the LPGA, which raises money through the LPGA Foundation, a nonprofit uh, branch or arm of the LPGA itself. Uh, <clears throat> so that's really been been awesome. And what we've been able to do is to create what we call girls golf sites. And they're low cost because we have some subsidy monies. And this has made these programs really available to all kinds of kids. Um, <clears throat> I was part of starting a girls golf site in San Diego for about 10 years. And we've grown to, gosh, from 100 to 200 to, uh, I think, triple perhaps that amount of girls' golf sites. And a site would be at a driving range or a golf course. And then the programs are the girls meet usually once a week, and we have uh, LPGA and PGA instructors, apprentices. Um, we have parents who help out as volunteers. And I mean, without any advertising, when we started, we had like 80 kids show up. I know some of these programs and some of my LPJ colleagues who are just such tremendous instructors, uh, they have hundreds of girls, girls, not boys and girls, girls in their 
programs, and they're instructional. What's really been interesting is that the impetus for the girls' golf programs started from recognizing that there was a difference in girls to compared to uh, co-ed working with boys programs. And what do I mean by that? It really is true. Girls like colors. They like their fashion. <laughs> they like their outfits. Um, they like to have, uh, you know, it could be the head covers or the, a pink shaft or uh, an orange shaft or whatever. Um, we did a lot of fun things where um, kind of bringing the martial arts in, instead of having belts, we used ribbons, colored mm-hmm. ribbons. And so once they learned and demonstrated different levels of different golf skills, short game, putting, long game, um, <clears throat> they got uh, they would get different colored ribbons. So they sort of went up through the ribbons uh, ranks, shall we say. We do all sorts of fun things like on Easter, for example, since it's Easter weekend, uh, we would get colored plastic eggs and then like little fortune cookie papers. We'd put a question inside each egg that had to do with rules and etiquette. And then we go and hide the eggs all over in the bushes and around the putting green and mm-hmm. everything. And so, and then we had teams, you know, we'd have teams and then we'd go and uh, they'd go and search for their colored eggs. And then we'd, they'd sit in a group with their pro and open each egg and go through the questions. Uh, stuff like that girls just absolutely, Absolutely love. Uh, boys, boys may love it too. Boys, I'm not sure yeah. so much. I know the girls love it. Yeah. Um, we would give them, uh, we created a program called Big Bucks because we know girls like to shop. And so, um, <laughs> with again, with different You're stereotyping. skills. stereotyping. I know, but I have to tell you, I mean, the stuff is, it, uh, it really has made a difference in how the girls learn. It's, uh, you know, and I hate to stereotype, but it's been kind of cool. Anyway, so we made this thing called Big Bucks, which is like making money. I mean, uh, if you want to not stereotype the girls, let's get them into making money and putting money in their pockets and, yeah. and having that be based on achievement, skills achievement. So, again, when they would um, master certain skills or demonstrate them, they got money for that. And then they would save up their money and have these big bucks. And then they can go through their closets and their stuff and stuff that they're ready to hand on and and uh, once or twice during the season, we would create kind of a shop, a bazaar shop, and everybody brings their stuff, and then they would have to price everything and sell, and they would have like a seller's market and buyer's market and use their big bucks, and that way they could buy new golf shoes or new clothes or new hats or whatever it was. So, you know, we tried to make it, shall we say, um, kind of the skills of both what you would call boys and girls, masculine and feminine, put all of that in there. And the girls just absolutely love that sort of thing. So um, there's been, uh, with with the growth of girls golf, our goal has been to have about at least 100,000 girls. And I think we're just about there right now. And it's grown tremendously. Um, lots of preparation for high school teams, college teams, careers in golf. And then those few who really have the ability to uh, aspire to the tour or um, mini tours, that kind of um, competition. And it's just really been tremendous. And we also do have, of course, co-ed clinics. And uh, the girls feel really uh, empowered, shall we say, and have the skills to to hang and to beat the boys. And they're like, that's fabulous. They love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you bet they do. Hey, let's take a quick, <laughs> we'll take a quick time out. We'll be right back. Jamie, when when a father has um, got daughters, daughter or daughters, and he loves golf, um, and he would like to spend that kind of time with his daughter on a golf course, I see it as opposed to just like, I want her to learn how to play golf, so it should be college golf. Forget that. It's about the quality time that they can have together. How do you advise the parents? What do you advise parents of daughters um, to get them started playing golf? That's a great question. I'll never forget, we were having a big girls' golf clinic at uh, the, the golf course I worked at, and a man came over to me, He um, and he has four, he had four daughters. They were young and growing at that time. And uh, he said, hey, can I get my girls in here? And uh, sure. So uh, we actually became very good business friends, and his daughters got involved, and um, – <clears throat> And what's been really great is I think just that they're in programs, they're learning to golf, and then to just go play golf, you know, take them to the golf course, take them to the driving range without 
as a dad necessarily putting in a whole bunch of your instruction, but just be with them, you know, and let them show you some things. Maybe you mentioned something. Go out and play. Uh, we absolutely loved our father-daughter and our mother-daughter days on Mother's Day and Father's Day. We created special events, and a lot of girls' golf sites will have special events for for those days, and so that mothers get to spend time with their girls golfing, and fathers as well. Um, And that's just been tremendous. So I think it's just much more about spending the time together, and of course, it's quality time going to the golf course. Absolutely agree with that. What do you see differently as mothers out on the golf course with their daughter versus dads out on the golf course with their daughters? Is there a a marked difference you noticed? Um, I can't really say. I think it's really just been important that the kids, the girls spend that time with their parents. And Mm -hmm. if their parents into golf, um, that's, that's, that's it. You know, it's really, I, I can't say that I really noticed uh, a whole lot of differences. You know, when I was growing up, which was way back when, and before we had all of these programs at all, uh, <clears throat> my parents had started playing golf. That's how I started playing. And my brother and I both got into it with them. I was seven. We went to a pitch and putt course and my mother actually became a much better golfer than my father. She was playing in state ams and shooting in the low eighties, running all the golf programs. My dad, kind of it was a 90s golfer <laughs> so it was really kind of interesting to see that mom was uh they, my dad was just as into it my mom was better in terms of her golf itself did they play from and, the same tees no i mean <laughs> they played from you know the, the appropriate tees in terms okay. of uh, you know i mean and you know the tees in terms of tees by the way uh, i think that it's very good we've been getting away from sexist language of uh, the women's tees the men's tees oh yeah no no the front, and, the front you, you tees know, and yeah the, yeah the forward tees and all that sort of thing uh, it's so important i believe in golf that people play from tees that are appropriate and fitting to their game the distance that they hit the ball so that they're enjoying it and their handicaps and their scores reflect their real capabilities i mean there's nothing sillier than seeing some of these guys who are just awful they can hardly hit the ball they duff it off the tee they hit it out of bounds and i mean they're manning it out right in the back tees and it's it's ridiculous um or you know my dad um bless his heart you know blessed memory now but um uh i mean he played until he was 90 years old and it was like dad you can play the forward tees the senior tees whatever you want to call them like it just didn't make Make sense for him anymore to play the whites or the blues and once he did that it was wonderful he just enjoyed the game a whole lot more all of his playing partners pace of play etc cetera, etc cetera, just picked up and i mean i i'm a big fan of jack nicholas in terms of his public uh, being a public proponent for play the tees that fit your game well i you know but you know back to the kids and the parents i just please, think that yeah, it's I really want... yeah yeah it's yeah it's really about, I would say, the quality time that you can spend uh, and the, the kids and their parents spend, whether it's mom or dad or both parents, um, maybe siblings. Uh, and, and it's really been fun. I've especially enjoyed uh, parents who have daughters um, and maybe, maybe it's just, just the siblings or girls, you know, and their kids are girls. It's really been fun to see them uh, out there golfing together. And watching the the girls just grow in empowerment and comportment and their balance and their mental strength and their emotional strength and just just their their poise their maturity it's and uh, and the fun that everybody has it's it's really a delight. Yeah, um, the, the tees. I, I play the white <laughs> tees, and it's like, oh, you shouldn't be playing the white. I just, I want to have fun. I'm not trying to beat myself up out there. I'm not playing for, you know, if you want to play for money, we can talk about that too. But I just want to have fun. I want to do the best I possibly can. I don't have a problem playing the white tees. No one's giving me grief about it. You know, it's like, I, I look at the, I look the rating slope. I, I don't even look at the yardage. I don't know why, but yardage has never been the determining factor to me. It's It's more about. Uh, the the rating and the slope, mostly the slope. And I know what my range is. I know where I like to play. So I play those. Well, I mean, we all bump into our egos and men yeah. bump into their machismo. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they do. at least women don't have machismo to deal with. <laughs> 
oh, come on, you've played competitively. You can't tell me that there's not a lot of that, too, with women. Well, there's, you know, there's some of it, but uh, it's just, <laughs> it's not, uh, it, it's a, it's different, um, I would say. But, I mean, it certainly comes up. It's all our competitive juices and, right. you know, how far are you hitting and all that sort of thing. But, I mean, I think that women are very aware of all the different aspects of the game. And it's interesting to see senior golfers, and especially senior men, take great pride in their, how, how straight they hit the ball and in their short game. And they will make up for it by, uh, you know, chipping and putting you <laughs> to death, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, we do. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so what is the difference um, for you when you're giving instruction to, to men versus women? And if you have them in the same group, how do you address them differently? Well, interestingly, I'm kind of uh, teach a lot about what I call universal principles Mm -hmm. for success and not to get into a whole martial arts thing, but there are some universal principles that show up in every sport about how we actually use our bodies and how energy moves through from our bodies to the tools of our sport, which could be a golf club or a tennis racket or a baseball bat or whatever it is, a bowling ball, you know, and uh, the basic principle is that energy moves from the ground up and it moves from our feet through our legs into our hips and then up into the upper body. And I mean, if you think about throwing a ball, the first thing that happens is you kind of lift your foot and then you wind your hips and then comes your shoulder, elbow, hands and breath and it delivers power into the ball. And then the ball can either go far or has has ball speed on it, right? I mean, how does a pitcher throw a 90, 100 mile an hour baseball? It doesn't happen from just trying to use their arm. And um, so in golf, golfers are probably the most guilty, shall we say, of just trying to use their upper bodies. Mm. And I think it's because we're not moving around, jumping around like in tennis or basketball, and we're not just in a natural movement and flow where our legs are in action. We're just standing there. And then we're looking at the ball, and we see our hands and the clubs out of the golf ball, And everybody's focusing, so many teachers, on shoulder turn and straight left arm and their hands and all that sort of thing. And people, both male and female, don't learn enough about what we're now calling using your core and using your base, your legs, your feet. Looking at the footwork in golf, again, Jack Nicklaus said that golf's played between the arches of your feet. And here most people are working on in between their ears and in Mm. their shoulders and get this shoulder under their chin and now get their elbow into their side and keep their arms straight and all that stuff. And it's not that those things aren't important, but if you don't really learn what's going on in your lower body and use your lower body first to generate uh, your power based on stability, centering and stability, and then a relaxed upper body, which can then have club head speed and deliver more power into the ball than trying to kill it with your upper body strength. So why do I say all this? Because men have a different body shape. They, uh, and this was really interesting. There's a woman named Debbie Steinbach who used to teach and wrote some books called Venus Golf. And she really emphasized the difference in body shapes of men and women. Men have broader shoulders, narrower hips. And uh, so she would call that kind of a um, let's see how she, well, it doesn't matter. Anyways. So from that shape and because men have more upper body strength, they tend to use it. And then you combine that with that sort of machismo. I can, I can put brute force and overpower things attitude or testosterone based or however we want, we want to look at it. Men just really try to use their upper body force. Women can't get away with that. And men, honest to gosh, don't really get get away with it that well um, <laughs> when we're honest about it. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, women, in a sense, have an advantage. We have wider hips, narrower shoulders. We don't have the same upper body strength in general as men. And so when I teach women, I really emphasize the advantage that we have in having, say, a wider base, wider hips, and the necessity to generate power the way that every other sport does which is from the proper usage of the lower body uh, and then with a more relaxed upper body. So relying on 
not just upper body and arm strength, but really having to get into the full body and how to use uh, how, how to use the ground, how to use the body, how to use the core strength. And men who learn that, and in this sense, like I said, universal principles, I don't teach men differently. I just have a little harder time reorienting them hmm. away from upper body strength and getting them sufficiently interested in lower body power. Women, I can get them interested real fast and go, oh, and it's a big advantage. They're like, really? I have an advantage? Like, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, in that sense, I teach men and women similarly, a uh, little bit different challenges, as I said, getting them sort of bought in and on board. But I, I notice that men start getting more consistent, more accurate. They don't hurt themselves as much. They have more energy throughout the whole round. They feel better. They start honestly developing timing, tempo, rhythm. And women develop all those things, and they develop more power, more distance, more confidence. So, you know, that's my approach in terms of, of those kind of qualities. Does that make sense? And, and looking at anatomy differently. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. It, it reminds me of one of the very early episodes of Golf Smarter, which is actually coming up on Golf Smarter Mulligan soon. Um, I think it was Ben Alexander who talked about uh, swing fast, not hard. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, uh, so I said that to someone the other day and they're like, what is that? What do you mean? I said, because when you swing hard, you're adding tension. Oh, absolutely. Um. Yeah, well, you know, the swing fast thing, men really mix that up. <laughs> it's like if I swing fast, I'm going to swing hard. Yeah. yeah um no. Yeah, I, um and I know it's swing fast thing and obviously we need to have some club speed. We um, there there's a relationship of speed and power. At the same time, it turns out that people who swing in proper sequence and develop a consistent rhythm and that we'll have speed in it, but it's just in proper ratio um, and with a strong set upper body, uh, sorry, um, full body and lower body, and then a relaxed upper body. In fact, um, I've just been working with a woman down in Southern California. We are in a month. We've just completely transformed her game hmm. physically and, and mentally. Um, she'd probably be happy to come on here right now and just testify. <laughs> it's been so great. <laughs> um <laughs> And, you know, it's not – this fast thing tends to put people actually, oddly enough, into tension and into mm. like uh, – um, when, you know, when you say it that way. But establishing a strong set – and I talk to her a lot about swing set. When do we ever hear about a swing? When kids are swinging, right, on a swing set. Mm -hmm. And it's called a swing set. What's a set? Big, strong bars put in the ground with concrete – You've got to have a strong, stable set. Then you can have this swing that's kind of going, woo, 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 yeah? And you, when you put a kid in a swing, or if you could, I've told her, go, go to the playground, sit in the swing, feel your butt, sit in that swing, feel how centered you are sitting there. And how do you get the swing started? You could pull all day on the, the chains of the swing. You won't get anywhere. You need to push with your feet. And once you push with your feet and in a coordinated way, you start moving back and forward, back and forward. And as far back as you go back, then you relax and you let go and whee, you get this momentum to swing through. If you have someone standing behind you, your mom or dad or somebody pushing you, they don't just push with their arms. You take a step and you push with your body. And there's a timing about when you put your hands on the kid's back and woo, give them that extra push through. So these are all things that really we naturally know, but we don't think about it. And that's what we need. We need to have a strong set in how we address the ball. These are the fundamentals of golf, right? Posture, grip, alignment, set, and the muscles to uh, the strength in the legs and in the pelvic muscles and the back support muscles. We need to have all of that really solid. And then when we're learning not, you know, we shouldn't sway and we shouldn't lift up and you understand it from that set point of view. And then within there, you can turn freely and relax and let your hands and arms come through. And you understand how to do that based on your set, you are following natural principles. And as we looked at all that and she went to playgrounds and we talked about some other things. Oh my God. I mean, she's just transformed in a month. Fabulous story.
Well, that is such great. Mm-hmm. That's such great information. Thank you. All right, last question. We're we're big into uh, on the show now talking about golf balls because we've been pumping this uh, company, Two Guys with Golf Balls dot com, that sells used golf balls at half the price. What ball do you play, and why? <laughs> That's a good question. I like everybody. I kind of play around with them, and it's gotten confusing that golf balls you kind of can't even keep up with. Uh, you need a little computer chip to which one's going to give you more spin and why, and then which one's going to give you distance, which one's going to give you feel and around the greens and da, da, da. Um, I mean, I've always liked pro V's, uh, at the same time I, I've experimented with Bridgestones and lately I, I have really become more of a fan of some of the softer Callaway balls. They just seem to have a nice sweet spot, a, a nice sweet feel to them. And they seem to be getting a nice combination of the the distance and the feel that I want. So I think people have to experiment. Um, Most of us aren't playing at the super high tour level where we even notice the difference that much. Yeah. yeah, So I think people shouldn't trip out on it too much. Um, Oddly enough for me, I've become a fan of some of the colored golf balls. I mean, I'm such a traditionalist in, in some ways, believe it or not, Fred. <laughs> it's like, no, I play a white ball. You're kidding. <laughs> but my favorite balls, honestly, at this point, and this has nothing to do with um, with gender stereotyping, I really kind of like the the pink and the orange balls because I hit them out there and I can, they stand out on the grass for me. So I kind of can see where my ball is far away as I'm walking up to it. I can, I can find it. I can know where it's landed easily. The yellow ones are harder for me to see in the, con- you know, the contrast isn't this great in, in, with the grass. Um, even blue ones, I've tried blue ones once in a while and I can't find the contrast enough because yellow and blue and green are kind of that same palette. But, um, you know, I mean, that's another thing people might want to play around a little. Yeah. I thought it was great when Bubba Watson uh, started to become a spokesperson for Volvic Golf and Volvic is a... Uh, Korean company and they've become a big sponsor of the LPGA tour and they've been the ones that have really introduced color into golf balls. And so, you know, there you had Bubba out there of all people, right? This sort of, um, uh, you know, (laughs) this guy, Bubba, he's so funny, but you know, playing a pink shaft driver and a pink velvet golf ball and going, Hey, you know, I'm liking this. Hmm. It's so interesting. Just don't hit yeah. it in the clown's mouth. I, I don't know. I look at, <laughs> I see all the colored balls and I think miniature golf. <laughs> but, yeah. but golf, you know, but all right. Well, you know, Fred, we're all kids inside, the child inside. That's a, you know, the inner child kind of thing. Especially but, when um, you're on the back nine of your life. <laughs> you wanna, I want to go back. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Well, the other thing about a colored ball is then you don't have to mark it and to differentiate it from your playing partner's balls because they're true. all white. And uh, yeah. So, but I, in terms of used golf balls, the biggest thing to look out for is, uh, are they, do they have their pep, right? Do they have their zing? How long were they in the water? How long were they under a tree somewhere? I mean, um, I think that's more important in terms of the performance of a golf ball and with used golf balls. Absolutely. And I absolutely understand the desire to you to go for used golf balls because they are a lot cheaper and people lose golf balls. Yeah. So, um, but I, th- I just think it's important to kind of ask about where these come from or to check out uh, how your performance is feeling, how the contact with the ball is feeling uh, if you do start to buy some of the used golf balls and, and who your supplier is, who's your source. Right. Right. Oh, and that's why uh, I love the fact that they hand inspect every ball, uh, every ball that comes through, um, sterilize them, and then they, and then they grade them uh, three different grades. Uh, and the the highest quality grade, eagle quality, is basically a ball that's been hit once, if at all. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that's a used golf ball, hit once in the woods. Yeah. That, that's a used uh-huh. golf ball. So yeah. Well, and you know that does happen a lot. Yeah. <laughs> There's a yes, lot of good golf balls. Yes, <laughs> Lost golf balls. One of my favorite things is to be playing playing around somewhere and seeing kids who used to have lemonade stands have golf ball stands. I don't know if you've seen that, (laughs) but that just tickles me. Yeah, they're out there hunting, and then they make a little business out of selling used golf balls. And, of course, who doesn't want to give your money to the kids? (laughs) Yeah, right, exactly. No, listen, I live behind a country club, and I have a – 
I'm not selling mine, but I have seen the kids do that. Uh, yeah. All right, Jamie. Well, it's again, it's always been great to have you on the show. We've been doing this for a long, long time, which is why you're going to be featured on Golf Smarter Mulligans as well, because there's episodes there that people haven't heard in a long time and they can't get them on, uh, on, on the web. So it's why we're putting them back out. Well, I think it's a great idea and I'm very honored to be part of that. And I will say I have had just some wonderful responses from your listeners. And uh, really, it's been been great to, to work with them or some of them buy my DVD still, which are evergreen and getting a lot of benefit. And so I, I always appreciate the opportunity and love your listeners. Oh, boy. Yes. Golf Smarter Mulligans is finally available on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, YouTube.com slash Golf Smarter TV, Google Podcasts, and wherever, any app that you download your favorite podcast to. But it's still yet to be accepted by Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Pandora, which is probably due to pod fading. Pod fading is an extremely prevalent uh, situation because once people who are new to podcasts and once these newbies realize how much work a podcast requires other than just recording yourself talking, those platforms require at least five episodes published on a recognized schedule before they would include it. So it'll get there. But the fact is, <laughs> I forgot to do something and that's why it wasn't available. But it is now, so this is all good. So the third episode of Mulligans is being published this Friday, and it's called Once You're on the Course, How to Go Low, with Joe Seavers, who at the time was Director of Instruction at Snoqualmie Ridge, which was a TPC course back then. Not sure about that anymore. But in this interview, Joe shares insights on achieving lower scores once you walk up to the first tee box. It was originally published as Golf Smarter episode number 19. Golf Smarter Mulligans is supported by Autoslash.com and TwoGuysWithGolfBalls.com where you get 10% off every order of premium used golf balls every time with a coupon code GOLFSMARTER. Some restrictions apply. Uh, we're starting our regular giveaways on next week's episode of Golf Smarter. No giveaways on Mulligans. That's just going to be interviews. And I've, promo I've promoted this uh, giveaway now for four weeks to give everyone a fair chance to get signed in. But after that, we'll be giving away valuable gifts every two episodes. So you're going to have to pay attention and, and register each time. Uh, our first prize of 2019 will be a brand new customized Seymour putter. Deadline for entry is midnight Pacific time, 3 a.m. Eastern on Sunday, April 28, 2019. To register, go to golfsmarter.com, click on the Enter Now button, and good luck. Oh, and while you're on the site, we've made some updates to the homepage so that you can listen to either Golf Smarter or Golf Smarter Mulligans. You can watch our latest YouTube video or check out what we're doing on social media. Please take a peek and let me know what you think. I'd appreciate it. Uh, and you know, I thought that the last topic we had on golf balls would catch your attention, and boy, has it! Not only has Sam Hogan seen some sales come through from our golf martyrs, thank you very much, but we've already been receiving great questions about golf balls. And and please don't feel like you're asking a dumb or obvious question. Heck, <laughs> I feel like I do that every episode. So most likely you're not the only one wanting an answer to that question. So please submit it. And not only questions. Uh, Jacob S. wrote a comment after listening to the episode on our YouTube channel where he disputes what Sam said in the episode about amount of spin and how it affects amateur golfers. Sam is really fired up. I've gotten four emails about it from him. He's really fired up about getting to respond to that comment on the podcast and may even write something on his blog at twoguyswithgolfballs.com to straighten the record. So once we have about, let's say, a half dozen questions to answer, we're going to record a full episode addressing each one. We'll do another one just on golf balls because that seems to be something that changes on a regular basis and everyone has questions like, why am I playing this ball and why should I be playing this ball? 
And we want, you, we want to make it as simple as possible for you to submit these questions and have created many avenues for you to do so. You can submit a question to either of us via Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram using hashtag golf smarter or hashtag two guys with golf balls. Or call our toll-free Golf Smarter Academy line at 415-761-1498 or write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com, at gmail, gmail.com. And of course, you can always click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com. And before we go, it's time for our quote of the week. I like doing this. Uh, from Dr. Joseph Parent. This is from the chapter entitled, How Big Is Your Mind? in the book Zen Golf, Mastering the Mental Game. And he says, when getting ready to putt, let your view include more of the green and see the distance to the hole within that bigger space. Bigger space, bigger mind. Bigger mind, better results.